Boy, you want to talk about a huge step up in quality from what we left read last week. Okay, I'm exaggerating. It wasn't a huge step up, but it was definitely a step up. All right, real quick, before we start anything this week on the video, I do want to announce that I did get a dis my Discord set up, and I'm going to go ahead and link it in the description down below. Um, it is a little bit rudimentary and basic because I'm going to be quite honest, I have absolutely no idea what I'm doing here. So if any of you like are good with Discord and like have any ideas or suggestions, you want to jump on there and shoot them at me, that would probably be great. Also, real quick, before we do anything else in the video, I do want to address, <laughs> real quick, the Griffith thing from last week. Um, because, boy, you guys are very upset with me. I did go back. I did re-kind of look at all of it and reevaluate everything. And I think I narrowed it down to that one scene of him in the graveyard of swords. I just don't like it. I Going back and looking at it again, don't like that scene at all. Everything about that scene just rubs me the wrong way. I feel like narratively, him coming back and the reasons for him coming back and his motivations for coming back makes all perfect sense narratively. I just don't like that scene. I feel like <laughs> the whole thing would have played better without it. If that scene was just deleted, I feel like last week's read would have been infinitely better. I disliked that one scene so much that it tainted everything scene that Griffith appeared in afterwards. Like, for example, had he just not shown up there and had he shown up, like his first appearance been when he just kind of murders the city and starts gathering, you know, generals, that would have been so much better and fitting and cooler, in my humble opinion, um, than that real, real crappy scene we got in the, in the Graveyard of Swords. So... Yeah, I kind of looked at it again, minus that scene, and everything else played beautifully. So, I agree with all of you in the sense that, yeah, absolutely makes perfect sense. Any of my not jiving sense was that scene, it wasn't jiving with me on a personal level, I think. And I really narrowed it down to that scene. Everything else I've gone back to relook at, I'm like, no, that works, that works, that works. What about this isn't working? And every time I look at that scene, I don't like it. And um, you, you could love it. It could be your favorite scene. That's great. For me, it didn't work. Anyway, moving on. So this week on Berserk, Guts and crew are attempting to function as a group. And it is extremely clunky. On purpose. They're not doing good. They're not functioning well. They don't function as a group. And I love it. This shouldn't go smoothly for them right now. And it doesn't. But right now in the story, we're really focused, like, hard on Farnese and the fact that she really sucks at pretty much everything. She is good at nothing. So they give her, like, the one job of watch Casca and just kind of make sure she doesn't wander off. And she fails miserably at that. And she's so upset with herself that she just, like, goes and hides under a rock for the rest of the night. Then she comes out and Casca's just fine and everything's fine and dandy. And they're like, where have you been far to say? It's just, it's kind of funny. I don't know if it was meant to be funny, but I thought it was kind of funny. I guess it's just character building for far to say at this point. But anyway, they go, they run into this old man and they're getting directions or something to the, to, to the sea or the harbor. And he tells them that, you know, hey, if that's where you're going, look out because the sea is filling up with all these armored forces and these... The Holy See is gathering all their forces there in Midland, maybe, I forget. Oh, and by the way, if that is where you're going, which is to the sea, then be careful on the mountain pass, because there is danger in those them there mountains, and it ain't humans up there. Which I think is what I'm going to title this video, because I just I just love that line. It's trolls. And and this, this feels almost kind of silly. It almost feels like the Lost Children, where they were like, oh no, this is a fairy tale for kids, you know. And then this one's like, it ain't humans up there, it's trolls. You're like, uh-oh, where is this going to go? But if the Lost Children taught me anything, it's do not underestimate this guy and his weird side stories. But we go straight into a scene of Isidro stealing from somebody else. Uh, and he really is just a little bastard. 
I don't know what I'm supposed to get from the scene other than the fact that I just don't like him. Which then goes straight into a scene of Guts actually training him. Like, legit training him. I, and I, okay, I get that Guts allows these people to join him and allows them to help him. But him actively taking part in the training of Isidro was a little odd. And the scene ends up being quite bittersweet for me personally. Because I think it's really cool the fact that he's kind of getting... Uh, a fighting style. I also think the particular fighting style that he's getting is actually really cool. And the way that it's done and him working with his size and his abilities and then learning to do this and no, actually do this and do that. Like the whole scene's really cool. That's the sweet part of it. What makes it bittersweet is the fact that it's Isidro. I don't like him. And it sucks that the cool little fighting style is going to a real shit character. And there's a real quick scene of Serpico pulling Guts aside, which Guts thinks Serpico's gonna, like, basically want to fight him. And it's not. It's just a quick conversation about Serpico and Guts coming to what I would call an uncomfortable understanding between the two of them because they don't really like each other, but they're gonna work together, you know, for an end goal. And Serpico's basically his uh, wanting to be around and oversee Farnese and Farnese wants to travel with Guts so they're going to work together because they have a common goal or a common interest not necessarily because they like each other but then the girls are kidnapped by trolls and Isidro attempts to save them but he doesn't do a very good job when they are saved for real by the little girl Gandalf that we saw last time around I'm not gonna lie this particular edition this girl I like a lot I really do. But Guts and Serpico show up and the little witch runs away. She does watch them from a distance for a little while and she does pause to wonder why they were able to see her magic and why Guts and Casca in particular seem to draw a distortion. I felt a great disturbance in the force. Anyway, they come across an old drunk man lying around on the forest floor. I'm just kidding. He's not drunk. He just looks that way. No, actually, he was attacked by some trolls. His group was attacked by some trolls, and he's the only one that's left. But they were, him and his group were out looking for a witch that lives in this section of the forest. Dun, dun, dun. When the group, which should not be able to enter the area surrounding the witch's house because there is a spell protecting the witch's house and, pe and people from entering, stumbles across the witch's house, which again just speaks to the fact that there's something special about the group. They can penetrate magic spells, see magic spells, see magic, touch magic, interact with magic in ways that normal people should not be able to do. And I really like this house. I mean, just the just the design in general in general, I really like this. But we don't have time to admire the house because we got some mud clay golems. I'm going to call them clay golems coming at them to attack. They might actually be made of mud or clay, but they're golems, constructs made by the witch to protect the house, and they're controlled by these little totems that are inside, so they, it takes a while for them to realize why they just keep getting back up, but then they start to take them out. And, you know, classic witch defenses. But anyway, the little girl Gandalf watches the whole thing and eventually interferes so they don't destroy all of the golems, and then tells them that the old lady witch We'll see them now. To which we find out that the old lady has been waiting for them. And right here, I've got a feeling. I have a strange feeling. Like, I know something here. Like, why she's been waiting for them, or why she knows about them, or how she would know about them. But it's like a suspicion, sneaking suspicion in my brain. I think I know why she knows about these people, but I'm not sure. And now this whole next chapter is like page after page of exposition. And it's going to explain all of the magic and the magic systems and the way everything is, this is going to all be connected into the existing lore and the angels and the demons. And there are three separate planes of reality and the way the three separate planes of reality intersect and interact. And I just loved this chapter. I couldn't, I can't say enough about how neat this was to read. This edition is just wonderful. I loved everything about it. I loved everything about the magic, the magic system, the way that it built upon the existing lore, the way it 
fit into the existing lore, the way it expanded everything. I really, I really liked it. From a lore perspective, it deepened and enriched the story in ways that I didn't really see coming, and it didn't feel really bolted on. It felt natural. I thought it was great, and I really enjoyed it. Also in the middle of this chapter, they she asked them to go on a side mission, basically, to deal with these trolls and journey with her little trainee, the little girl Gandalf, and in exchange for doing this for her, she will place a talisman on their brands that will weaken its effects. Basically, protect them from the effects of the brand, which is the drawing of the demons. Give them a little bit of a break from this brand and everything that it kind of brings upon them. To which they agree, of course. I mean, why wouldn't they? But she also says that this talisman that she puts on the brand is time sensitive. It will eventually run out. But she says, but it'll, it'll last through to the end of your journey, I'm sure. And I can't help but feel like this is going to come back to bite them in the ass at some point. Not necessarily that her placing the talisman on their brands is actually a bad thing or that it's going to somehow negatively impact them in the future itself. I just feel like the way it was worded, like, oh, I mean, it's temporary. It should last to the end of your journey, though. I feel like it's going to run out. And I feel like it's going to run out at the worst possible time something bad is gonna happen when it runs out you know or because the brand has been suppressed for so long it's gonna lash out in some weird way when it finally does get released from the talisman i don't know i don't know why but something about the way that was worded just makes me feel like something bad will happen when this runs out anyway we'll see but then we get a bath scene uh, a bath scene with Casca and Farnese, and it feels kind of like a bath scene that was pulled straight out of a completely different manga. Not this one, but whatever. <laughs> but in the meantime, Guts is in there talking to the old lady witch, and he's going to ask her if she knows what a behelot is. And of course she does. Uh, it's a stone, and it the stone summons the god hand, and the god hand are the five angels. And she explains, you know, pretty much everything she says we already know, so I'm not sure why we're rehashing it. But we are, just in case you missed it the other ten times the behelot was used. But she does say, I really hope it's not yours. Yeah, <laughs> like... Now, now, the next part, though, where he asks what the god hand are was a little bit interesting because she says she does not know, but she does know that they were once human and they execute the will of something lurking deep within the abyss. You know what this tells me? Whatever that creepy thing lurking within deep within the abyss that they're executing the will of, this tells me one thing. That thing ain't God. I'm just saying. God would be like, you know, the all-powerful force that created the universe. Not some dark, creepy creature that dwells at the pit in the pits of the abyss. Boom. Confirmation. Not God. I don't know if it's God or not. But I'm saying it, damn it. It's not. It's just a creepy abyss monster. But the little girl Gandalf talks about, talks to the old witch about how she doesn't want to go with Guts and she really doesn't like having to travel with them and she doesn't know why the old lady wants all this to happen. And in the midst of it, we get some shots of Griffith. And this is the incorporation of Griffith that I like. I like that he feels like some just far off distant presence, this overwhelming presence. You know, now that he's been re reborn, he's this force that's lurking out there that we are going to eventually come to terms with and have to come to blows with. And for now, I like that he's just these weird flashes that people get. And oh no, he's back. And oh no, that presence. Oh no, that man. You know, these are the shots. This is where it works and it fits and it's great. Not that stupid fucking scene with him from last week. But the little old lady basically says, suck it up and deal with it. And now it's time to prepare for the journey ahead. She gives Guts and Casca some temporary talismans for their, for their brand so that they, you know, can go ahead before the old lady gives them their permanent talismans. But then the little girl 
hands out like magical items to everybody, kind of like Galadriel from the Lord of the Rings. You know, I mean, so far as we're getting like magical weapons, the, the girls even get like magical chainmail shirts straight like Frodo. I mean, it was so ripped right out of the Lord of the Rings. It was it was kind of crazy, but whatever. Uh, first off, I really like that they're getting a much needed upgrade. It is a, at a, a point in the story where I really appreciate the leveling up that they're going to give the group. They're going to give everybody magical weapons because the demons are just going to get worse and Guts continues to get better. But we need to get these people leveled up so that they can continue to travel with Guts and they can continue to help and be continue to contend with the forces that are just going to keep coming at them and just keep getting stronger. So the level up was much appreciated, although the design of the stuff that they got, like the weapons and like the triangle dagger that the Isidro got or the leaf sword that Serpico got, ah, I thought that just the design in general of the magical artifacts was leaned too far into the silly for me. I wasn't a huge fan of it, but I love the fact that they got an upgrade. So, you know, give and take, I guess. And to be fair, out of all the magical inclusions thus far, I've just been head over heels in love with all of them. This is the first time that there was a magical inclusion that I went, ooh, I'm not sure I like that. So, all in all, in the grand scheme of magical inclusions, considering that this is the first one that I haven't just raved about, you know what, so far we're, we're definitely in the positive. Although it is hilarious because she actually attempts to give Guts a new weapon and he's just like, nah, <laughs> you keep your axe, I don't want it. And it was just great. What did you expect, Guts to be like, oh, okay, okay, whoop, no. But anyway, they're off, and as they're walking away, got senses of presence back in the old house, and kind of looks over his shoulder, and then just keeps on going, and we get a shot back at the house, and who's inside but Skull Knight, and woo, and I was right, and I don't know what about that witch, whatever she said earlier, made me immediately go, oh, this chick knows Skull Knight, but I mean, I had this weird suspicion that she was, that Skull Knight was somehow involved with this, and here he is. For once, my intuition was right, I'm so proud of myself. And apparently he's an old friend of the witch, which is awesome, because I like the witch a lot, and I like Skull Knight, so I like this. And if I haven't mentioned it already, I love that section. Everything about it, the little girl Gandalf, the house, the magic, the incorporation of the magic, I can't say enough about just that last couple chapters in general I thought were phenomenal. I love them. I love, love, love them. Anyway, we travel to a town that's being attacked by trolls and the town is run by a priest and the priest is an asshole. I mean, the priest is just predictably an asshole. What do you expect? But anyway, the people in the town, especially the priest, aren't going to allow them to stay because, you know, they're newcomers and especially because of the little witch girl. And believe it or not, it's Guts who swindles or sweet talks there or kind of manipulates, twists their way into town, which I thought was kind of surprising that he would be the one to figure that out. But OK, but now we're in town and the little girl who. All right. I'm officially going to attempt this because the second I saw this name, I was like, well, shit. <laughs> like, and I've just been calling her the little girl Gandalf. But we're going to attempt this here. And I looked it up, and I mean, you're looking at it, and you're like, that looks German as fuck. And it is. And then, so then I look up how to pronounce this word. Bear with me here. This name. And I find the most ridiculous things I've ever seen on any name pronunciation for Berserk. And I thought Farnese was hard. I mean... You go looking for a way to pronounce that, and you're going to get about a hundred different suggestions. And then people get mad in the comments no matter which one you pick, so it doesn't matter. But, I mean, I saw, like, a paragraph-long description as to why the proper pronunciation of her name is Silk. And I'm like, that's insane. Uh, no, that's the craziest thing I've ever heard. Clearly, if you look at it, it's German. Just because it comes from a Japanese manga doesn't mean that German words somehow are pronounced. I can do the closest I can come, Wushika. And 
That's what we're going to go with. Shirk. Da. Shirk. I mean, I guess it could be Shirk, but I doubt it. I would put money on Shirka. Anyway, and that for some reason to me was e easier than Farnese. And I, technically, I think if you want to be super French about it, I think it's Farnese. But anyway, that took way too long. But anyway, now we're in town and Shirka gives them all a piece of hair to tie around their fingers so that they can communicate with telepathy. Which feels a little unnecessary. Maybe it will, de will prove itself in time, but I don't know. We'll see. Isidro goes off to practice his sword play, and he continues to fall over because the sword is so heavy, and he's so little that it knocks him off balance that he's trying to use the sword one-handed instead of two-handed, and it's just not working for him. When the little old man from before comes up and wants to have a whole conversation with him and wants to kind of talk to him, and, you know... And it's just very clear at this point that Miura is pushing really hard on Isidro to make him less abrasive and grating. It just feels very obvious at this point how much he's pushing Isidro to be much more a much more relatable and likable character in the manga, and it's just not working for me. I, it's great that he's learning and he's growing and he's going to be a much more useful member of the group. This is all great, but he's still completely insufferable. Shirka scopes out the church and decides that this is going to be have to be where they have the big battle with the trolls when the trolls come to town because the church was built on holy ground, which was an old pagan holy ground before it was a church. I mean, some real Stonehenge-y looking stuff. And Serpico's coming to terms with the fact that Farnese smiles now. And it looks actually almost a little overwhelmingly he's happy that, Sir, uh, that Farnese smiles now. But it almost looks like he's just a little bit sad that it's not him that has made her smile. But just the fact that she smiles in general now looks like it makes him pretty overwhelmingly happy. But the trolls attack! And good God, speaking of Serpico, does he really jump right in there and almost immediately figures out how to use the magic of his new stuff. So quickly that it surprises pretty much everybody, Shirka included. Isidro can't seem to figure out how to use his, which, you know. But he does throw the little nuts or whatever those are. And then Guts runs in and... You know, he gutses. Shirka shows up on top of the church and yells at everybody to get inside. And she's going to cast a spell when the priest comes out on top to stop her. Because, you know, priest. And then Farnese runs out behind him to stop him. Because ex-priest. I don't, <laughs> I don't know. But she actually feels very conflicted about doing it because she feels like she has no right to stop the priest because she used to be a be like him therefore stopping him makes her feel like a hypocrite she gets over it but there for a second she's real conflicted about running out there and stopping this guy but anyway the whole place is overrun like immediately by these trolls and the group has to pretty much figure out how to just not die long enough for Shirka to cast a spell. And every once in a while, Miura just stops to put some pictures down on paper that just take your breath away. And I've said this many times, but we're just going to pause for a second and look at some of these panels because this is fucking impressive. I love these. I love this fucking character. Now, to be clear, I'm not even 100% sure that I'm sold on this girl's personality. But I love the character in the sense of I love what this character has brought to the manga. I love the art that comes along with this character. I love the expanded lore that this character has brought in. I just love everything that this character brings to the story in general. I, I just, I really, this has been my, probably my favorite inclusion in a long time. Anyway, she casts a spell of protection and all the trolls inside of the spell of protection are immediately killed and no more can get in. When an ogre shows up to the party. Let's be honest when it comes to the creature design on this ogre. All this is is a sperm whale with legs. 
But anyway, it can't get into the church because of the spell of protection. So it just starts launching like logs and wooden beams and stuff. You know, real Headless Horseman style from Sleepy Hollow. You know, that movie. When for no apparent reason you turn the page and there's just like this horse frog thing. But these beams that this ogre's throw in are a massive problem for the group. So Guts is going to have to go outside this protection spell and he's going to go right into the middle of the fray and he's going to take on the big ogre. And it's great. I, what, what, what do you say? It's wonderful. It's, it's a big, it's a big Guts fighting creatures being Guts. When the horse frog attacks, and it's actually a whole lot meaner than the creature design would suggest. So Serpico goes running out there, you know, because he's the one who actually knows what he's doing, or at least knows how to use his new equipment. And he takes on the horse frog. So now it's this big battle with Guts fighting the ogre and Serpico fighting the horse frog. And this is great. Like, everything about this is really fun. And now they're going to have this big battle while Shirka is up on the roof attempting to cast another spell. It's just, I, I'm impressed. But by far the best part is when the horse frog is almost too much for Serpico to handle because his new leaf blade really just isn't doing the trick for him. When he busts out his old rapier and he starts dual wielding his new leaf sword and his old rapier. <coughs> I, I was, I was literally speechless at how cool that was. I was, you know what? It is not easy, my friend, for Guts to be headlong in the middle of battle and for somebody else to be the coolest thing happening at that point in time. And you're standing next to Guts. Way to go, Serpico. I, I applaud you, sir. I was by far my favorite part of that whole fight scene was him dual wielding. And it was great. But the witch is going to call a tidal wave of giant proportions and it's going to wipe out, oh, you know, the creatures and the town and the church and Casca and Farnese. And I mean, it's just insane what happens when this tidal wave just really flushes through. Like, Guts is stunned. I, he's just like, oh my God. I think he says something like, now that's magic or something. But it also wipes out Shirka, considering that she gets lost in the abyss and doesn't know how to find her way back. They kind of have to help her come back, which just shows just how powerful she is. Also, just how maybe untrained she is in the scale of her own power. But we're going to wrap things up with the old man giving Isidro a smaller, lighter blade that will be easier for him with his smaller size to wield so that he won't, you know, fall over every time he tries to use a sword one-handed. And the priest is going to come out and admit that he's coming around to the fact of, you know, maybe the witch isn't such a bad person after all, which is actually a very surprising revelation for this priest to come to, considering how rigid most of the religious figures up till now have been. And I just thought that was a fun and refreshing way for the priest to come around in the end. I liked that particular beat of the story. And now the crew are off to go get Farnese and Casca back because we don't know what happened to them and we lost them in the wave. And all we know is that Shirka has sensed that they are alive and well. That chapter ends with them kind of like wandering off to go get them. And I just kind of had to call it a day because <laughs> I feel like this is going to be a big kind of thing in and of itself going to get them back. And I, I go... Oh. We'll just have to save that one for another day. But anyway, I, you know, I really debated on this. Like, I probably shouldn't be rating these. With how small of chunks that I've been, that I'm reading, I'm like reading like two volumes at a time. Uh, and so I probably shouldn't be rating them. But you know what? I don't give a shit. I've already started this. I've set the precedent that this is what we're doing. So guess what? This is what we're doing. And I'm going to tell you right now, this section, at least this little blip that I just read, I feel like was, I'm really feeling a nine. I uh, almost didn't. I was going to give it that 8.75 again. But no, no, I think this one's just going to take a nine because I had that much fun with this section. I really, really did. So anyway, nine. And I'm just going to thank you all for coming and I will see you all next time.